Hello everyone, my name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel. And today we have a very exciting interview. We are going to be talking with one of the absolute experts on hypnotism in the BDSM community. And we are going to be discussing hypnotism. So I asked you guys for some questions over on Instagram and you guys gave some really great feedback. So I am going to be incorporating those into this interview. We're going to be covering covering just the basics of hypnotism, everything about what it is, how to do it, and how to incorporate it into your DS and into your BDSM relationships. So uh, if you would like to introduce yourself, maybe give the audience some background, both in your experience in BDSM and maybe how you got started in doing hypnotism. Oh, wow. Okay. We will, we will keep this short so that there's enough time for, for lots of Q&A. But hi, um, my name is Mark Wiseman. I go by Wise Guy inside the community. Uh, I am a professional hypnotist. I am a teacher of professional hypnotists, and I do erotic hypnosis education for fun. I've been practicing professionally since 2002, so a little bit over 15 years. I may have spent some time prior to my official training playing with it in a sort of a self-taught half ass kind of way. Mm -hmm. We don't like to admit that sort of thing, but I've probably wise guy dates back to 1999 when I started publishing hypnosis related erotica on the mind control stories archive, mcstories.com. So, wow. yeah. So 20 years. Pushing 20 years. Uh, shoot, I should probably do some sort of special edition of something for the 20-year mark. I, have, I still have a little time to think about that. Oh, God, now I feel old. Eh. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, you've been doing uh, hypnotism for a really long time, and, yeah, yeah, 20 years. And it's always been hot. I've always thought it would be hot and fun, and, of course, the early stories were less realistic. Uh, and more like Hollywood hypnosis. And mm -hmm. and then I had this attitude that, you know what, if I'm going to do this, write about it, I should really study my subject matter and learn how to do it well. And so the stories got more and more realistic. And that struck a chord with people. Because there was a lot, at the time, there was a lot of, oh, I flashed a light into her eyes and turned her into my bimbo slave. Um, and at the end, and there's a segment that enjoys that sort of thing. There's a segment that enjoys fantasizing about being the bimbo slave. But for those of us that really sort of like some romance in our porn, uh, there wasn't a lot out there. So I, I kind of found a niche. And uh -huh. realistic, uh, romantic, hypnoerotic has sort of became my thing. Is that how you got started kind of going into the more actual trained professional side of hypnosis? Or did that spark come later? They sort of grew together. I fell into professional hypnosis uh, from the client side. I actually mm. saw a hypnotist myself for purely vanilla reasons. And turned out that I had a talent for it. So I got training and started practicing at the same time as I was writing all of this sexy erotic stuff which really taught me how to compartmentalize my brain, which turned out to be a really useful skill. Yeah, I uh, bet. <laughs> uh, but I didn't really get involved in the BDSM side of things until about 10 years ago. Is that because lack of community around hypnosis or lack of desire to kind of participate in a larger community? Or was it just sort of how you personally evolved in incorporating hypnosis into your life and into your, your eroticism? I kind of, yes. Um, I didn't know anything about the BDSM community uh, up until I started meeting people that were in it. What happened really is I developed into a relationship with someone who was in New England. And my good, good friend, Lady Ruefa, happened to be traveling over to New England for a fetish fair fleet. Okay. And she asked me to come and hang out with her and, and help her do classes. She also had me come to a Dark Odyssey event with her. And so Lady Ruetha introduced me to the whole concept of BDSM thing. And I mean, talk about getting thrown into the deep end of the pool. Yeah, going to <laughs> a Dark Odyssey and flee, definitely. And it's, it's interesting. So it sounds like 
hypnosis sort of existed as sort of like a separate fetish, like in sort of the way that maybe foot fetishes separated or in late latex, not necessarily something that has to be part of BDSM, but can be incorporated into it. Exactly. And there were, there still are a lot of little pockets of people whose really only kinky thing is that they're really into hypnosis and they like the way that it lets them play with power exchange and whatnot. But as we started coalescing, uh, a community started forming and we started doing something that we never thought any of us would do, which is meeting in person. And we started having annual conventions where we would get together and have classes and practice and play parties. And as we did that, we started kind of flirting more and getting more up close and in touch with the overall BDSM community because it turns out we have a lot in common. Yeah. We're all very concerned about making sure that things stay consensual, about making sure that everybody is safe, about making sure that everybody has a good time, about making sure that scenes are hot. Uh, so we have a lot of common ground, and it's kind of interesting because a lot of the mainstream BDSM folks are afraid of hypnosis. They, they see it as this really, really risky, crazy, edgy type thing. Yes, and we'll definitely get into that because the vast majority of questions that I got, because uh, my community and the people who consume content for me are BDSM, mostly power exchange first, and then other things in addition. And so I think, uh, especially with, if you remember a few years back when FetLife was having all of the issues with uh, credit card processors and, and payment and everything, and hypnosis just got like wiped off of FetLife along with blood play and a bunch of other types of considered to be edge play items. And it was so interesting, kind of at that point, I did not know anything about hypnosis to kind of see, I think, how much people in the BDSM community see hypnosis as like this really scary, somewhat foreign form of edge play that people don't really know how to how to handle or like accept, mm -hmm. especially when it's somebody they don't know uh, doing hypnosis, maybe at a play party or somebody messaging them on FetLife, talking to them about, you know, are you interested in hypnosis and not really being sure how to take that. But uh, before we get too deep into kind of talking about the nitty gritty of hypnosis and how it overlaps with BDSM or maybe how it doesn't, uh, let's just maybe talk about what hypnosis is because there were also a lot of people and uh, myself included who were sort of like, well, how does this whole hypnosis thing actually work? Because I think the way that people are usually introduced to hypnosis is through those Hollywood representations of the, you know, the spiral on the television or having the light flashed in the eyes. And I think maybe there are ways in BDSM where you can incorporate those elements of sort of the fantasy aspects, but then obviously there, there must be some kind of reality in people's brains that make hypnosis actually work quote unquote to some degree could you go into that a little bit oh sure now what gets interesting about this is the the written history of hypnosis goes back to like 2600 bc so we've been messing with this under one name or another for 4,000 years and we still don't really entirely understand why our brains have this really weird trick that we can do that for all practical purposes, no other mammal does. But it's it's a really interesting sort of thing. And people that have been playing in BDSM for a while have probably been adjacent to hypnotic states and just never really labeled it as such, never thought of it. But anytime you have somebody who is getting very absorbed in a particular concept, whether it's somebody's voice, somebody's implement, uh, a spot on the wall, or a feeling, a sensation, to the point where they sort of step outside themselves a little bit and they become very open to just following instructions, suggestion. You've basically got hypnosis, even if you're calling it subspace or top space or rope space or head space or little space. All these spaces, all the different combinations. That was one of the questions I wanted to ask about was, is it the, is, is trance state sort of is is it like a cousin to subspace do they overlap or does it kind of depend on the the person in the scenario on a functional on a functional mri they look exactly the same the level of brain activity is very very similar really honestly the difference is usually intent mm, okay how you get there and what you do with it but tops get into that sort of focus state too a top who's who's working hard with fire say or needles or rope is very focused on what they're doing and reading feedback from the bottom that they're playing with on what they're doing. 
that's also very much a focused concentration trance-like state. So it's not as uncommon as people think it is. What's unusual about it when we call it erotic hypnosis is that we set out to do it deliberately as the purpose of the scene, as opposed to it being a byproduct of some other activity that's already going on. Okay, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense, sort of how it actually shows up on MRI. So maybe if people are skeptical about hypnosis, being able to have something really solid, like here are studies using MRIs we've looked at, the state of the brain does change. We don't necessarily know why, but here's some facts maybe that you can look at. Okay. And that's exciting stuff because that's only been going on for about the last eh, 12, 14 years that we've had functional MRI studies where you could put somebody on the machine and watch the electrical activity in their brain change in predictable ways as they go from awake into hypnotized state, into trance state. It's really interesting. So now we can finally tell those people that say there is no such thing as hypnosis. No, 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 we've got actual physical evidence. It's actually a state. We're not quite sure why we evolved it. Uh, we have a lot of theories, some of which contradict each other. Uh, but it's definitely a thing. Yay! For Yay, years, science! <laughs> yeah, for real, for real. Now, that tends to fool people into thinking that everything about hypnosis can be measured scientifically. And the reality is it's, it's impossible to control for all the variables between people. So it still becomes largely a matter of, well, we tried this and it works. Let's try it some more people and see if it works consistently. Oh, hey, it does. Great. This is a thing we can do. Ooh, that only worked for a couple of people. That's probably not a thing we can do. And I mean, that's, that's how hypnotists, that's pretty much the entire body of knowledge about how to do hypnosis and get effects with it is the reason trial and error. Yeah, is it reliable and repeatable? Exactly. And since people are themselves vastly different, there isn't actually anything that's reliably repeatable for the entire population. Everybody has their own little unique brains, and I'm sure different things kind of help people get into their own hypnosis state. And definitely, let's, let's talk more about, about that later. Um, what I want to talk about is sort of how, how or why would you incorporate hypnosis into kink? What's the appeal of having this be something that you do with a partner? Why do people enjoy hypnosis? Ah, well, of course, like any other kink, there's a lot of different reasons people get into it. For some people, they get into it because it takes the whole concept of power exchange to a whole other level. Somebody who goes into a very subby type trance where they actually feel their body involuntarily responding and following orders from another person, find that really incredibly hot. And it can be really hot on the other side to have somebody let you into their head so deeply that they will pretty much just follow within your negotiated limits, of course, whatever you've agreed to do. There are people that find just the slow surrender sort of feeling of either watching somebody's eyes kind of glaze over and close down or being the one whose eyes are glazing over and closing down. Uh, but that in and of itself is just intensely erotic for them. And then, of course, there's the different applications. There are people that absolutely love being able to have their brain messed with in ways that change how their body perceives things like touch mm -hmm. or temperature. Uh, they love having being able to have their inhibitions lowered or raised. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to emulate interesting things like hypnobondage is a whole discipline all itself. Where, I mean, yeah, you can tie people up with real rope but you can't do it in the parking lot at Walmart unless you have rope in your car. And you don't mind the security cameras watching. <laughs> you don't mind the security cameras watching, exactly. Uh, or if you've got somebody who really, really wants to be super glued to the wall. Uh, that tends to have ruinous consequences for the clothing that they're wearing, not to mention hair and skin, if you try to do that in real life. But you can use hypnotic suggestion and stick people to the wall like it paper, which is a lot of fun. Uh, you can also enhance people's sensations so that that flogger you're about to hit them with is way more intensely painful, or if you want to tease somebody who's into pain, less painful. Oh, brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. Or it can feel like feathers, it can feel like tongues, it can feel like a violet wand. 
anytime you get into somebody's brain where they process all those sensory inputs and things, you can do really fascinating things that aren't necessarily practical in a real life sense. It's fun. Yeah, it's a being able to sort of make a different reality in some ways. Take the information that's in somebody's brain and mold it and mess with it to come up with something completely different from what they're actually experiencing in real life. Yep. You can also mess with emotional state. You can get somebody intensely turned on with a snap of the finger if you want. And it's an emotional response that then causes physical reaction. So if your sub is a penis odor, you can turn them on and then watch them get hard for no reason other than you chose to have them do it. Mm-hmm. Again, it's a little bit of a power trip. Power corrupts, but you, know, you, can, you can have fun. You want to make sure you're doing it with somebody for whom the power does not corrupt absolutely. Exactly. Well, fortunately, it's not absolute power. That does make it easier. People forget that sometimes. But even though it's hot as all get out to to pretend that you know the hypnotist has absolute power and complete control and all of that, the reality is the relationship is everything because mm-hmm. it's all ultimately based on trust and communication. As soon as you lose that, for whatever reason, you lose all the power. Because the power is actually in the mind of the person who we think of as the submissive or as the bottom. Okay, yeah, let's go into that more. Because like I mentioned, uh, people's number one concern and question about this topic was the safety aspects, the consent Mm -hmm. aspects. And I think that's definitely really important to discuss. So, Oh, yeah, it's huge. And frankly... Uh, One of the problems of professional hypnosis is that it's very loosely regulated or Mm -hmm. unregulated, depending on where you live, which means anybody can put a sign on their door and say, I'm a qualified hypnotist and start hypnotizing people. Well, erotic hypnosis has the same problem. Anybody can say, I'm an expert on erotic hypnosis and go start giving classes and lectures and there's no real vetting system so and i hear about this a couple of times a year somebody who i've never heard of before who goes off and does you know their erotic hypnosis class and they commit just egregious consent practices they they run roughshod over people's permissions they present hypnosis as this horrible sleazy nasty thing that you can do to people to make them do what you want instead of what they want Uh. At which point it then takes, you know, there's there's a bunch of us that then we sort of, our response is to, okay, no, look, let us sh- let me show you how it really is. Here, we'll come over and give another class for you. And, and try to get the word out there that actually the really effective hypnotists are the ones that don't do that shit. The ones that actually get to know the person that they're playing with, to communicate with them, show respect for them, have respect for them, because it's not just about what you show, it's about what you feel. Mm -hmm. negotiate clearly what you're going to do. People don't, one of the things that I spend a lot of time in classes on, because I teach a lot of beginning hypnotists, is it's not just that it's the right thing to do when you're negotiating, you're also establishing expectations. And hypnosis is built on trust and expectation. So that negotiation is important to building up in their brain what's going to happen so that when you go to make it happen, you have a leg up. You're sort of starting the priming process almost when you're negotiating in some ways. Exactly. And it also gives you opportunities to find out how that person's mind works. Phrases that they like to use. Thing, you know, things that you mention and they, they kind of perk up a little bit and their eyes dilate a little bit and stuff like that. You start noticing and learning what their hot buttons are while you're negotiating so that when you're doing that scene, you have a whole bunch of toys that you've already got permission to play with. So if you're somebody who's looking on getting started in in hypnotism and, you know, maybe you have heard a lot of these bad things that other sort of hypnotist teachers or tops in the community have done, how can you safely evaluate, one, a top, but also evaluate a submissive, two, if they're going to be Mm -hmm. receptive to hypnotism? But primarily, how do you know if a hypnotist actually is going to do what they say they're going to do? And how can you tell if they actually know what they're doing? Those are the golden questions. So the best answer that I have for those right now is get involved with one of the many, many, many local erotic hypnosis groups that are springing up all over the world. Find the one that's closest to you, go to the munches, meet the people, 
you will quickly figure out who the friendly people are. You'll figure out who the knowledgeable people are because they're going to be the ones that are probably answering most of the questions and leading the discussions. Mm -hmm. And you can find out who the experienced subs are and you can start asking them, well, have you played with so-and-so? How are they to play with? You can actually, you know, somebody says, hey, I want to hypnotize you. And they haven't actually tried to get to know you first. That's probably your red flag right there. Yep. <laughs> um, but you also have, then you have a structure you can go to to vet that person. Hey, you know, Joe Blow says, uh, says he wants to hypnotize me. Have you ever played with Joe Blow? All right. Were they any good? Were they, you know, were they, were they douchebag or were they respectful? Okay. You can actually vet with people like that. It's harder when you're just online, of course, because then you've got basically the entire internet and it's hard to find the knowledgeable people in a large group like that. Yeah, and especially if you've never experienced hypnosis before. I, I, yes. I can imagine it's hard to differentiate between, okay, what I, what this person is saying is the right thing versus what they're saying is the wrong thing. It's harder to kind of test their skill set when mm -hmm. you've never really done it before. And because this is a communication-based art, you also can start to evaluate, well, do they just talk the good game or do they actually behave mm. in accordance with the rules that we like to have laid out. So and that's another place where being able to vet people comes along. If you don't have that, then you have to draw a lot of conclusions from how is the contact initiated. And I alluded to this a minute ago, but for example, somebody who just messages you out of the blue and says, hey, I want to hypnotize you. Why? <laughs> that would be a warning sign. It also works the other way around. I mean, I get random random, uh, you know, Google Hangouts messages and, and FetLife mails and whatnot from people going, I want to try hypnosis, to which my response is, that's nice. I see you're in Terre Haute, Indiana. Okay, I believe there's a local group in Fort Wayne. How far is that from you? You can meet up with some people. That's not the answer they want. Yeah. The answer that... they want is, I'm pushing a button on a fetish vending machine. Why won't you give me what I want? Mm -hmm. That's Unfortunately, a lot of that happens. So when you see somebody engaging in that sort of behavior, that's a warning sign. If you are a subtype looking for somebody to experiment with hypnosis with, where you want to be on the receiving end, probably you want to join up with a local group. We have national cons about four a year. If you can get to one of those, that's a massive safe environment where you can get to find out who are the people. You can vet people right there at the event. You can get to know them a little bit. And then if you hit it off, you can start making, you can talk about you know doing Skype trans uh, meetups and things like that. You don't necessarily have to meet somebody and play with them immediately at the event, but they are good places to get a feel for who are the people that you might have an interest in being and playing with. Yeah, that's actually true for people that are looking for folks to hypnotize, too. Is there any sort of special concerns that you have as a top or somebody who does hypnosis when you're trying to evaluate if it's going to be somebody you want to hypnotize or not? I know I've had several people ask me, not just for this, but in general, you know, I, I want to be hypnotized, but I've, I've struggled with this for this reason, or I don't believe I can be hypnotized. Is there is something that's more mind over matter, or is it just some weird quirk in the brain where some people simply cannot be hypnotized or don't receive it well? So a lot of it is personality and situation and context. Generally speaking, anybody who wants to be and doesn't have limiting beliefs or things kind of holding them back can be hypnotized. The trick is, to what degree is it going to feel the way they think it's supposed to feel? Are they going to get the kind of result that their their expectations dictate to them? Almost everybody, the first time they go into hypnosis and come out, they almost everybody goes, well, wait a minute, that's not what I thought it was going to feel like. So we get these, and this happens to a lot of people, they have this expectation that it's going to be like, you know, get out, where somebody tinkles their teacup and then just, boom, they're gone. It's like somebody knocked them out for an operation. And generally, it's not like that. Being hypnotized, in some ways, it's kind of like being drunk and that the person who is actually doing the drinking is the least qualified to tell how wasted they are. Uh, when you're in hypnosis, until you've got some experience under your belt, you're the least qualified person to know how hypnotized you are. Once you get some experience and then you understand what it feels like when you shift into these different modes of consciousness, then you're in much better shape to know. But first, you have to know what to expect. And in order to do that, you've got to gather data. Because if all the data you have is watching movies, you're going to be very disappointed 99% of the time. There are very few people that just organically cannot be hypnotized. 
mm-hmm. because it's it's a level of brain activity. So if your brain is functioning in a in a way that's congruent with life, you probably have the capability of entering that focus state. Some people have more difficulty than others. There are organic conditions that can cause you know an inability to to hold and sustain focus. I'm not talking about ADD. I'm talking about serious brain deformities and injuries, things like that. Uh, there are people that are already in an altered state because of something that they may have recently inhaled, imbibed, or otherwise taken into their bodies, in which case they may be incapable of concentrating for a couple of hours. But after that, if they want to, sure, they can go into hypnosis. The biggest impediment is usually people who don't want it mm. or who don't believe that they can have it, and that's often based on these unrealistic expectations. So when I have somebody like that, what I'll usually do is we'll talk extensively about what they expect, why they have that expectation, and I'll spend a lot of time kind of going, okay, so let's set all that aside, and let's just kind of, let's do a couple little things and just see what the experience feels like for you, and then we'll decide afterwards whether or not that was actually the chance. And if I can get people to set that stuff aside and just be open to whatever happens to become different, Usually they manage to have some kind of a decent first experience. Okay. There's always going to be a few people that have some limiting belief or something that holds them back. And, you know, no cake is for everybody. Yeah. If they want it enough, or I shouldn't say if they want it enough, because that sounds like it's all their volition. But there may be stuff in their head that's kind of holding them back from it that they're not consciously aware of. You know, they may consciously really, really want this because it's hot but there may be some inhibition thing in the back of their head, and it's probably beyond a casual recreational type hypnotist's ability to work around that. It's yeah. probably something that they need to work through on their own and then come back to hypnosis and see if they're ready for it or see if they've shifted their mindset in a way that will let them experience it. Yeah, I find that for a lot of people who come to me and they're sort of struggling to reach subspace or they're struggling to do DS at the level they want to do it, it's a lot of times it's about they really, really, really want it, but they want it so badly that they almost believe they can't do it. Mm-hmm. Like there's, there's no way they'll ever be able to actually reach that level. Or a lot of times it's also a lot of submissives really struggle with uh, self-esteem or with self-efficacy and so they believe that they're not really good enough to deserve something like being able to get to subspace or being able to reach trans space and i think if you are able to recognize that in yourself and kind of notice i'm struggling in this area where i I want something so badly that i can't believe i i deserve to have it then if you can take time to work on that maybe that is something you can do and then you can come back to hypnosis later when you've been able to work on those underlying inhibitions that prevent you from experiencing things that you really want to experience. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these things are very zen-like in that the harder you try to get there, the more your own brain kind of gets in the way. Don't overthink it. (laughs) Yeah, sometimes when you just let go and say, you know what, I don't give a shit if I get trans or not, I'm just going to enjoy whatever happens, that's Mm. when it happens. Or subspace, or whatever other experience. And I find a lot of times people, especially, again, if they haven't really experienced it before or done anything like it before, the, the fear aspect of it, like, they can really want it, but they're afraid of what's going to happen while they are in trance. Or, you know, am I really going to lose total control of my body? Am I really going to have X, Y, Z thing happen? That can be another thing. <laughs> yeah, hint, no, they're not uh, going to lose total control of their body. And generally speaking, it's normal for people to remember what happens while they're in hypnosis. You can, of course, suggest that they not, and some people will be okay with that, and some people won't. Ultimately, of course, it's their brain that decides what's okay and what's not okay. Yeah, can you go into that a little bit more? It's that it their brain decides. Is there some kind of like defense mechanism built into the brain that sort of helps set up boundaries around hypnosis? Uh, not specifically around hypnosis, but there is a a little functional component in the mind called the hidden observer. At least that's what the hypnosis researchers call it. Uh, simplest way to explain that, when when Trog the caveman was out stalking his prey, the hidden observer is that little piece of his own awareness that's always checking to see whether anything was stalking him. So it's that little piece of the analytical, critical factor, conscious mind, that never entirely goes away. 
every suggestion that comes in to somebody who's in hypnosis or subspace or whatever does have to get filtered through that. And something that is obviously unacceptable, self-destructive, the hidden observer's job, is to jump up and go, no. Now, it is not a perfect mechanism. Yeah. There, you've probably heard, a lot of people have heard, oh, well, hypnosis can't make you do anything you don't want to do. And mostly true. However, hypnosis is based heavily on trust. And I think we all know that there are people who know how to abuse trust. Mm-hmm. Hypnosis does not make anyone more resistant to that. It doesn't make anyone smarter, more able to spot deception. It doesn't make anybody more resistant to being lied to or coerced. And a unscrupulous person, you'd be surprised what they can get you to want, at least in the short term, to do. Mm -hmm. Again, it's sort of like being drunk. When you're already in that state, you're not in your best decision-making mode. And if somebody wants to and has a persuasive enough argument for it, they may be able to get you to agree to something in the short term that has long-term consequences that you're not thinking about. Mm -hmm. So this is not something that you just kind of casually do with people you just met at a bar. Yes. At least it really shouldn't be. There needs to be some communication, some basis for trust there. Otherwise, yeah, there is potential for people to get taken advantage of, just there's potential for people to get taken advantage of once they're tied up or, you know, once they've had a couple of drinks or, you know, insert judgment impairing activity here. Mm -hmm. The big difference is hypnosis can wear off faster, but that doesn't mean that something untoward has not already happened. Mm -hmm. I guess my short version of that is hypnosis alone cannot make you do anything you really don't want to do, but unscrupulous people yeah. Ah, understood. Okay. Well, I think in terms of preventing unscrupulous behavior from happening, how do you build in things like uh, boundaries or safe words into something like hypnosis? Is there a way that even when the submissive is under trance, uh, they have reassurances of ways to be able to stop something if maybe they feel like they're being persuaded in a direction they don't want to go or, or something along those lines? Absolutely. Um, we are, of course, we teach negotiation and consent practices very aggressively because it's so easy to miscommunicate. It doesn't even have to be a deliberate breach of consent. Accidents happen, especially in something that is, you know, that is all communication based. Miscommunications are easy to do. But also we stress and that the people have agency. People that go into hypnosis have agency. That hit observer is there. You can always... Make sure you can practice it, having that hidden observer come in and say stop. I give people hypnotic suggestions to automatically say safe words when they're appropriate to say, because that's one of the great things you can do with hypnosis. You can have that safe word come out of their brain instantly before they've even had a chance to consciously start processing and going, yeah, do I really want a safe word here now? Oh, but this is going so well, well, except for this one thing I'm not real cool about. We can actually shortcut that. And essentially, we can install the safety suggestion that they just say safe word immediately. And that way, we know when something is wrong. Of course, another thing we do is we teach hypnotists to check in frequently, regularly, to make sure that they're still in a good path, that their uh, partner is still in a good place. So when you're doing the check-ins, is there a way or some like specific tells you look for to see if somebody's having a quote-unquote bad trip? Is it something that if the person is having a bad experience, do they jolt themselves out of it or can they get almost kind of like lost in the trance state? People, again, people respond to things differently. It is very possible for somebody who's not having a good time to pop themselves out of trance. It's usually not a pleasant feeling. If you're paying attention to the person that you're playing with, you can generally tell if they're not having a good time. People start to get strained expressions. They start to look unhappy. You might see some head shaking. These are all really good specific indicators that, hey, wait a minute, something is not right. You know, we like to teach people to use a yellow safe word for, hey, wait a minute, something's not cool here, but I'm not quite ready to just blow the entire scene yet. Excuse me. I also teach people to use green. As ah. in, this is very nice, please. I would like more. Mm -hmm. uh, we like that. 
And you know, one of the regular check-in protocols a lot of, of a lot of people use is just status please, green, yellow, red. To make sure they get a green back. If they get a yellow back, then it's time to stop and go, okay, what's what concerns do you have? Rope started to get a little bit tight around the ankle. Okay, you can fix this. Hey, even if it's not actual rope, they can still get that sensation. Yeah. So the check-ins are important. And you know, that keeping in close touch, hypnosis is not something where you drop somebody into trance, give them a suggestion, and then walk away. Yeah. Yeah. You you stay with them. I teach hypnotists that they are responsible for that person, for their, their physical, emotional, and mental safety and well-being for the duration of that scene and aftercare. We take that seriously. One of the most serious uh, consent-related things, uh, problems that a hypnotist can commit is to take somebody, put them in trance, and then walk away. Yeah. We, we do not condone that. Yeah, you don't leave somebody in bondage and then go and get groceries. <laughs> exactly. But even you know, even then, you know, you also you don't grab your buddy who may also is a rigger and say, "Hey, you know what? Would you hold on to them for a couple of minutes? I have somebody else over there I want to go tie up." You don't do that either. And hypnotists should not be doing that stuff. And generally, we don't. But as in any group, there's always going to be exceptions. Yeah, the proverbial few bad apples, as it were. Yeah. So we work to get rid of those people as quickly as we can. The, uh, the local community groups have their own methods of dealing with local level complaints. The national cons, which are Mindquake, which is uh, coming up the first weekend in November. Mm. And then Charmed, which that's uh, San Francisco. Oh, Charmed in San Francisco this year. No, uh, no. Charmed is always in Baltimore. Uh, Mindquake is in San Francisco. Oh, okay. They're the next ones up on the calendar because it's September. Uh, then Charmed in January in Baltimore, then Nihu in Hartford, Connecticut in March. Usually in July in the Chicago area we have in trance. There's question that that con is sort of in flux right now. That event is probably going to end up changing a lot of its operations, but we expect that there's still going to be a Midwest event in the summer. We're just not quite sure what the details of it are going to be yet. But those con cons communicate with each other. So that, for example, if somebody transgresses at Charmed, uh, which I'm one of the concom for that event. When we've had our consent team look into it, we have a report done, we tell the other concoms, okay, there was a complaint uh, regarding person X, the decision we made regarding what to do with person X was this, just letting you know. So we don't have a formal ban list, but then they can go, oh, wait a minute, they had a, Charmed had a problem with this person. Maybe we need to look into that. And that way we have a way of, we, that way somebody can't get an infinite number of strikes just by going between different events. Yeah. Is there something like, uh, in the bondage community, there's the Rope Bottoms share group, basically, which is a place where specifically Rope Bottoms can go to share their experiences and ask for people in a closed environment that's not accessible to tops other than people who switch. Uh, is there anything like that for, for people who do hypnotism where they have like a private group where they can share things? Or is that maybe an idea that might be something good to have in the future? There isn't that I know of, but I love the sound of it. Ooh, I like that a lot. Yeah, and it's something that I think has been really helpful in the bondage community for people feeling like they have a safe space to maybe not necessarily openly name people, but discuss concerns that they have and and not have to deal with tirades of comments on FetLife or, or judgment from people saying you should have done this or this. And I, I think it's something that could be very helpful for forming communities specifically for people on the bottom side of the spectrum. Yes. Ooh, I love that. Thank you for that. Yeah, of course. I mean, you're here <laughs> talking to me about hypnotism for an hour. If I can give you one great idea, I am happy to do that. Uh, yeah, you just did. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. I am all about keeping people safe. So that is my number one job. Uh, so uh, moving on, I guess, into more, let's see, safety related questions. I think we we may have that pretty well covered. One thing I wanted to ask about is, again, for those submissives and bottoms who are having trouble getting into trance space, we did talk about communication, obviously, and negotiation 
before the scene, is there any sort of independent practice that they can work on prior to doing hypnotism with a partner or any kind of exercise that they can do to help them get into trance at a later time? Uh, I'm a big believer in teaching people how to do self-hypnosis as a practice uh, because, I mean, it's, it's as good a way as there is to practice being able to go in and out of trance without necessarily having somebody else there. The trick, of course, is then it becomes a chicken and egg thing. Well, if I can't get into hypnosis yet, how will I so do self-hypnosis? So usually you need to help get them over the hump one time, or I'll teach them a method and then have them practice the method. Yeah. With, you know, with time and practice, they can start They can start learning how to develop that skill within themselves, because going into hypnosis is a skill. It's something that you know some people are just naturally good at it, and we're all jealous of them. <laughs> well, no, we're not all jealous of them, but yeah, it's, it's an enviable thing, and they look like they're, you know, they're the bell of the ball at any event. And then there are people that have to work at it. I was one of those people that had to work at it, so I have a lot of sympathy for the people that, that are just like, eh, I don't know if I'm really getting there. Oh, it sort of works, but sometimes I don't really think it's working, or sometimes I think I'm just helping it out. I have a lot of sympathy for those folks because I'm one of them. But self-hypnosis is really good practice. If you uh, if you don't have that immediately available, there are a lot of really good content providers that do recorded inductions and short suggestion things and whatnot that can give you the experience of a hypnotist working with you. It's not interactive, of course, because you're listening to a recording, but for some people, that's enough to get them over that hump. Mm, and I would mm-hmm. recommend people like The Secret Subject, who is really phenomenal, Ultra Hypnosis, uh, Fiona Clearwater, folks like that, that I know personally and that I know that their ethics are unquestionable. Well, everybody's are questionable, but theirs are extremely good. Okay. Thanks for the suggestions. I was also going to ask about in terms of pre-recorded or uh, you know, audio-based hypnosis, if those are actually things that are helpful for people, or is it, you know, because that trust relationship isn't there necessarily, is that something that's sort of dependent on the individual? A lot of them are. Uh, there, I mean, there's a lot, again, anybody can make a recording and say, yep, I'm a hypnotist. But there are some that are really, really good at it and who do keep the ethical standard way up there. And yeah, I mentioned Secret Subject, I mentioned Ultra Hypnosis, uh, Fiona Clearwater. There are also a lot of, of professional people who do you know, who will do live sessions. Uh, Leah Lore will do live sessions. Uh, Central Spiral does live sessions. I'm trying to think of other people that I know. I don't spend a lot of time on the recorded side of things, so I don't know as many uh, content providers there as I probably should. Are there good like written prompts, maybe? Uh, I don't know how that works in comparison with an audio recording. Does is there a way you can like read your way <laughs> into being self hypnotized? Or you can. I mean, if you read text that is designed to be hypnotic in nature, you can find yourself kind of drift a little bit. One of the textbooks that I use when I teach my uh, my professional classes is actually a transcript of a training session, and there is a lot of trancey language in that book, and people nod off while they're reading the book. They find themselves like they keep turning pages and then at one point they hit the end of the chapter and go, wait a minute, I don't remember anything past page three. Except it's there when they look at it again, it's familiar, which is kind of fun. So yeah, you can do that. Now the caution with that is you got to know where it comes from. Mm. If you just cruise Tumblr and you're following a lot of hypnosis type blogs, you will find stuff that comes up that's a deliberately trancy language post. And you don't necessarily know where it came from. A lot of them are really cheesy. And, oh. and the suggestions like reblog this and say I definitely was not hypnotized and crap like that. <laughs> um, you know, and it's practice, I guess. But it's like you really kind of want to know what you're putting in your brain. So something that you sought out yourself, I would be more inclined to recommend rather than something that randomly comes up on your Tumblr dash. Yeah. Always yeah. be cautious with Tumblr, with anything related to, to BDSM or fetish content, because you don't know necessarily where it's coming from. Exactly. And you yeah. don't know when it came from either, because they won't date anything. Yeah, exactly. Like, eh, how outdated is this information? So what I want to make sure we get to before we wrap things up here, some different ways that people use hypnotism. And one thing that I really wanted to ask about is, uh, like, co-trance. Is there... 
a way that you can do a situation or does it just happen sometimes where both the top and the bottom or the hypnotist and the one being hypnotized are in trance together and how does that work if that's something that does happen i love to do that oh so oh, it is so a thing there's multiple permutations on this uh you can have multiple hypnotists and one person or, or a group of people getting hypnotized you can have mutual hypnosis where you and your scene partner hypnotize each other at the same time and you essentially just end up playing out usually some sort of a shared fantasy type thing oh. uh, while you're both in trance now mm -hmm. A lot of hypnotists, and I'm one of them, do actually kind of drop into trance a little bit while they're working with somebody else. I do it because it's how I was taught to do it. I do it because it gets us into deeper rapport so that my senses are sharper regarding how they're feeling and how they're accepting what's going on. Uh, and it kind of it, it, it helps to hone the instincts a little bit. So there are good reasons to do it. But as far as just recreationally, Essentially, you can have a hypnosis scene where everybody is a top and a bottom at the same time. Mm, to like co-creating the the trance together. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, some of the most fun scenes I've done have also been things like like turning the tables type stuff, where we just we switch roles three, four, five, six times uh, in various ways. Oh, those are yeah. fun. Yeah, I'm sure. I I don't uh, know. Well, I know a few switches, none that do hypnosis, but definitely the, how do you do hypnosis when you're a switch or in a relationship with a switch and being able to play off those roles? Oh, yes. Yeah. Switches have so much fun in hypnosis. <laughs> it's definitely not a hypnosis 101 skill set, I imagine, but uh, you can get there eventually. Well, I mean, it's a pair of 101 skill sets, really. It's the topping skill set and the bottoming skill set. It doesn't take, it doesn't take huge amounts of formal education to learn how to get somebody into, into trance, especially if you're already in a play type relationship where you've got that foundation of trust and whatnot already built. So somebody who understands from experience how they go into hypnosis is only a step or two away from being able to help somebody else getting into that state. And then what happens is the, the switches who play together start putting triggers in each other's minds where you know, they could just make a gesture and the other person has a response. And you have what we call switch wars, where they're constantly just essentially pranking each other <laughs> uh, in ways that, you know, sometimes they get really hot and sexy and sometimes they get silly. And they're always fun. So, yeah, switches really do have more fun in hypnosis. Yes, uh, switches, we love you. <laughs> uh, one other thing I wanted to ask about kind of in the same vein is... Uh, uh, we talk a lot in terms of the 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 top or the dominant being the one to do the hypnosis. Is there a way that somebody who is a submissive can hypnotize their dominant? Is that something that's common, or does it depend on the relationship? Or it depends on the relationship, but it's certainly something that's done. I've taught classes and had to do it um, because, in in a lot of ways, it's a really good way for somebody to be able to perform a service for their dominant. You know, I let my wife hypnotize me for fun and pleasure uh, <laughs> as a service to me because she's, we're, we're, we are mostly lifestyle BS, but we're kind of low-key about it. You know, she doesn't wear, her collar goes around the third finger on her left hand uh, and it's metal. So it's a nice, what we call her socially acceptable collar. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but that's our, that's our power dynamic, but I'm, perfectly secure enough in my role that I'm willing to to step back and let her drive once in a while and she enjoys it. She also likes it when I drive. So there are lots of possibilities there. But I have taught uh, I've taught normal bottom type folks how to hypnotize their top as a service because it can be very relaxing. It can be very pleasurable. And I teach them particular language that respects the power dynamic while allowing them to perform that service that you would normally think of as topic. So yeah, little things like um, just you know, you know telling their their dominant. And of course, we both know that the power is in your mind, and I can't make you relax even more deeply into the chair, but you can. That sort of thing. Yeah. Earlier, we touched on masochists and hypnosis, mm -hmm. and 
one of the questions that came up a lot is, can you use hypnosis and is it ethical to do so to push boundaries or go beyond what would typically in sort of normal reality, let's call it, of what a, a person's body can do or what the person's body can take. And a lot of people seem to kind of come at this either from the angle of, uh, is it a problem with pushing the bottom too far? And I also had some tops who seem to see hypnosis as a way of a bottom, like not having to work as hard, <laughs> which I thought was kind of a, an interesting perspective. That's uh, fascinating. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, you get hypnotized, you don't, uh, the bottom could be lazy or something, which is like, I had never even considered that perspective before, but. That's weird. I tend to think of it as the top is being lazy because the bottom's brain is doing all the work. Mm -hmm. But that's just me. So as far as exceeding physical limits, um, the body's limits are not enhanced in any way by hypnosis. Their tolerance for things that get close to those limits could be. But for example, you can hypnotize somebody and then you know turn them into a statue, frozen position. And they can hold that position for a very long time. But when they stop, they will feel all of the fatigue that somebody would normally have felt from holding that position for however long they were holding it. And if that position is disadvantaged leverage-wise, if you've got if, you know, like if you have somebody locked in position with their arm extended and a bowling ball in their hand, that hypnosis will not make them stronger. They will strain muscles holding up that bowling ball. So that part, you know, that part of the question, can you, you know, does anybody get stronger or have more endurance or anything like that? No, they really don't. The body still has the limitations that the body has. Mm, it's more about the mental blockages around it. Exactly. You can certainly work with the mental parts. You know, if somebody wants to increase their ability to feel and perceive pain, you can certainly work with that. If somebody wants to explore a really deep emotional edge, like, you know, bunnies have always scared me. I want to do a bunny scene to help get over my fear of bunnies. Well, now we're verging into therapy a little bit, so that's not an appropriate thing, but you know, if you want to do a buddy scene just because they don't scare the crap out of them, you can use hypnosis to put buddies there in there, in there that are not actually there. And give them that fear reaction if you want to. Uh, as far as the ethics of pushing boundaries goes, no, don't do that. If you want to negotiate pushing the soft limit, that's fine, but that's just like it would be for anything else. Mm -hmm. Hypnosis isn't special in that regard. No, it's not. Okay. People's limits are still their limits. As they should be. And uh, my limits are still my limits. Yeah. I have had people try to push my limits when I topped them. And no, uh, I stand my ground on those things too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we could have a whole conversation just on the top side or the, the hypnotist side of doing hypnotism and, and having their limits and boundaries respected. And I think, at least since I've gotten started in the kink community versus what I've read, you know, books from the, from the 90s and the early 2000s, I think there's been a lot more awakening around sort of doms have aftercare and doms have limits and you know they get to negotiate to use safe words too if they want to and i don't necessarily know if that conversation's always been around but hopefully we're getting more and at least in bdsm and f the fetish world at large into talking about the people doing the actions and the people in power and doing actions they also get to set up their own boundaries as i think maybe there's a little bit of a sort of myth around you know, if the submissive or the bottom didn't set up any boundaries, then the dominant would just run roughshod over them and they would do whatever they want because uh, whatever. <laughs> I still have mine. Mm -hmm. And I tell, I tell people that I'm about to play with for the first time what they are. You know, I tell them, I don't care how much you want it. I will not humiliate you. I will not inflict actual pain. I will not break skin. Things like that. That's not me. I play with your brain. Mm -hmm. And you, I assume that besides your personal limits, people can incorporate physical sensations on top of doing hypnosis, or is that something that distracts from the hypnosis? No, or? no, actually, it can be used as a focusing thing. Okay. Um, yeah, in fact, there's a whole a whole fun way of getting people into trance that involves kinesthetic sensations, stroking the hair, brushing hair, little circles on the palm, little space on the back of the neck. 
drawing attention to a touch and using that to guide somebody into that focus trance state. You could just as well start doing a Florentine on somebody and focus them on that sensation and move them into trance while you're while you're fogging them. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Well, I know that we're getting close to time here, so I want to wrap things up with one last big question, and that is, um, you know, we've talked about using hypnosis to maybe push past boundaries. What about doing behavior modification, especially in a DS relationship? Is it possible to do hypnosis that lasts beyond the hypnosis scene, such as, you know, teaching a submissive their rules through hypnosis, like not being allowed to open doors is one that I have. Uh, would it be possible to use hypnosis to teach a submissive to, you know, not open their own door or, you know, not eat before the dominant starts eating or something like that? It's possible. It's a kind of a gray area because when you start talking about long-term behavior modification, you start really kind of blurring the line between play and therapy, mm -hmm. permanent personality change. It is certainly possible, but very few people are actually trained to do it. So I would be very, very careful to make sure the lines of communication are very open, make sure that you know that that Dom has the proper training and experience and knows what they're doing. Uh, but yeah, within those, you know, with all those caveats, yeah, you can do it. Okay, so it's possible, but not something that's a lot of people are trained to do. Is there any risk uh, that you could accidentally cause something that happens long term outside of the scene? Like having something maybe in the scene, say your partner is not allowed to open their doors doors for the sake of the scene and accidentally take that behavior outside of even when the trance is over. People's brains interpret things in all kinds of interesting ways. So the law of unintended consequences is always there. Usually these things are not going to be super harmful because as soon as the person goes, wait a minute, that wasn't meant to work that way, their agency kicks in. Mm -hmm. Especially if the inability to open the door is going to do something like keep them stuck in the house. But I like to, I like to stay on the side of let's avoid forcing somebody's brain to make those judgments. Let's you know, make sure that everything is nice and clear. Uh, it is always possible to accidentally either exacerbate or uncover or step on emotional sludge that we all have in our psyches from various things that happen to us. Uh, the biggest risk in doing casual hypnosis behavior mod type stuff is that sort of thing where you might accidentally remind somebody of some traumatic thing that happened to them and they either become, they get triggered by it and horrible reactions happen or I've seen people accidentally give their submissives an eating disorder by trying to hypnotize them to lose weight. Oh no. They didn't know how to do it. Yeah. You know, things like that. That's where that's where the training thing becomes a much more serious issue. For casual play, it doesn't take years of training to figure out how to get somebody to have an orgasm. But if you're going to start trying to modify daily behaviors like that, you need to know more about what you're doing than a standard recreational hypnotist does. Yeah, and is that something where you would need to go and actually take like professional classes and go to seminars, or are there still resources online that people, or at you know, standard conferences that people can take to learn those skills if they wanted to get to that place? The techniques we're talking about are largely the techniques used for hypnotherapy, so you can go to vanilla hypnosis classes to learn that stuff. Uh, and in fact, you probably have to because I, I'm the only kinky hypnotist I know of that does that level of training. I probably, I'm probably not the only one, but I'm the only one that I know of. I do, I do classes that are specifically offered to kinky people only, simply because I don't want to mix kinky and vanilla people in the same class. There's too much potential for information leakage. Every once in a while, somebody asks me about that sort of thing, and that's basically what we talk about. Is we talk about look. You know, responsibility, understanding that what you're doing here is digging into behaviors beyond casual play and make sure that you understand what techniques you're using and how they can go wrong so that you can correct if they do. Okay, uh, well, I think let's wrap up now because I want to make sure you have time to enjoy the rest of your evening. Is there anything else that you wanted to bring up or talk about before we wrap up? See, my, uh, my my wife will be uh, she will be very annoyed with me if I do not mention the books. 
Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> I was going to ask about the books if you didn't bring them up, but... I'm horrible at self-promotion. I, I go to cons and I'm, I keep forgetting to tell people, buy my book. So there are two books. One is, The first one is Mind Play, A Guide to Erotic Hypnosis. That is a uh, an introductory guide. It's sort of a, okay, here's what erotic, erotic hypnosis is about. Here's a few things that we do with it. Here's where the community is and how to find them. Uh, and then there's the Mind Play Study Guide, which is the master class. That's 27 individual lessons on everything from, there's about 20 different inductions in there, uh, entire chapters on how to do orgasms, how to do robot play, or I'm sorry, doll play, how to do uh, consensual non-consent, things like that. So it gets, it gets deep. Um, they're on Amazon. Uh, they're also in Kindle Unlimited. Uh, and they're, they're out there. Uh, if you get one and you find me in an event, I'll sign it for you and I'll run something snarky in the cover. Because <laughs> I love doing that sort of thing. But there is also uh, Leah Lore and DJ Pynchon have a really great book out there called Hypnotic Amnesia. Uh, the book you remember on how to forget. And that is focused on memory play. And bunches and bunches of different techniques for memory play. That is a great book. Really good book to pick up to learn techniques from. And Leah Lore is such an amazing and talented hypnotist. You can learn a lot more than just memory play by looking at her book. Uh, come to the cons, because the cons are great ways to meet people, develop relationships with people that you know you can play with, uh, and then maybe you'll play with them online in between cons. Uh, I think I said Mindquake is the next one coming up. That's mindquake.org at San Francisco at the beginning of November. Uh, charmedhypno.org will get you to the Charmed website. Uh, our registration is open now. That con is in January in Baltimore. Uh, Nehu.org, N-E-E-H-U, is the Connecticut conference. That happens in the spring, usually mid-March. Uh, I don't have a URL for the Midwest con because they're in flux right now, but those are definitely places to look depending on where you are. There is probably a local group nearby that you can get education from and people to play with. So there's a FetLife group called uh, Erotic Hypnosis Community. Look them up. You can actually search for the word hypnosis now too, which is nice. So those are the best ways to get a hold of people. You can always ask me questions. I'm WiseGuy35 on Fet. I'm Hypno Obi-Wan on Tumblr. Uh, you can, and I'll take questions from anybody. So you can reach out and ask me anything and I'll try to point you in the right direction. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us today and answering all of those questions. I certainly learned a lot. And definitely, I have those books on my reading list personally to check out. And uh, hopefully, people uh, will be able to contact you if they have any additional questions. Again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's been really lovely. It's been wonderful meeting you. And uh, I hope you have a great time with this. Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm definitely going to start exploring now that I have a little bit more information and hopefully maybe my audience feels a little bit more comfortable doing so as well.